Thessalonians chapter 1, 9 through 10. Again, Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. For thy themselves shew of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols, to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. We welcome you tonight. Regarding Scott's comment at the beginning of uh, the lesson, I want you to know that I was not mean to Scott after he had his memory lapse this morning. I did not say anything derogatory to him. I just wanted to have pity on him because Dad always told me you can't have hair and brains both. So, <laughs> all right, Scott? Yeah, okay. I look, I went a long way for a little there. We um, appreciate you being here tonight very, very much. Church of Thessalonica was established in Acts chapter 17, and I don't know what gods they worshipped in that town. I can't find it. We know that in Corinth, they worshipped the goddess Aphrodite, and they had a thousand sacred prostitutes at the temple. We know that in Ephesus, they worshipped the goddess Diana and felt like they were the owners of the goddess Diana, the guardians of the temple of the great goddess Diana. And we realized that a lot of these pagan cities had a lot of temples to a lot of different gods, and they worshipped these gods. They worshipped these idols. I don't, rem I don't know exactly if archaeology has told us what gods there were in Thessalonica. From what I read, they just had many of them, and not one in particular, like the cities that we mentioned just a few moments ago. But we know this. That when Paul went there in Acts chapter 17, the first thing he did was went in the synagogue and he reasoned for three Sabbaths, three different weeks. He probably was working during the week while he was there. We find out in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And then he went to the Sabbath for three Saturdays. He converted some Jews. He converted many Gentiles, some of the heathen idol worshipers. And he converted a number of the leading women as well, verse 3 and 4 says. Well, after that, some of the angry Jews that were there got upset and dragged Jason and some of the brethren that met at his household, apparently, to the rulers of the city. And there was a great deal of persecution before Paul and Silas eventually left town. When Paul writes back to these brethren, it's probably just a year or so later, and he commends them. He thanks God for them in chapter 1, verse 3. He commends them for their work, their labor, and their patience in chapter 1, verse 4. And he goes, or cha that's chapter 1, verse 3. And he goes on to commend them for several other things, including their evangelistic nature. In verse 8, he says, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, those were the regions, the region of Thessalonica was Macedonia, the region of Corinth, where Paul probably was at this time, was Achaia, for from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. People have heard about the faith of the people in Thessalonica all over these regions. They didn't have the news, they didn't have the newspapers, they didn't have all kinds of modern access to modern media like we do, but somehow word was traveling. They were getting out the word of God from them. But also in every place it went. I don't know if that's hyperbole or what, but it, did, it went to everywhere that he could think of. He said, your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Now I think he's being hy hyperbolic there. Does he mean the apostles are going to stop preaching because, well, the Thessalonians made the gospel known well enough? No, that's not it. He's not going to stop preaching. But he's being complimentary toward them. Your faith has gone out and been an example to people. You've been evangelistic with it. So that we don't have as much work to do. Then he complimented them for their changing. For their massive conversion from idolatry to a living God. That's a huge thing. I don't realize if we were, I don't know if we realize in this country what a huge thing it is for people to change from worshiping idols to serving the living and true God. He commends them therefore for it in verses 9 and 10. For they themselves declare concerning us, that is the people whom we have heard from Macedonia and Achaia, declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. 
We're all appointed to wrath if there was no Jesus, but since there's a Jesus, we're not appointed to wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 10, we can be appointed to salvation if we'll just follow him. But it takes some repentance. And some of the most drastic repentance, I think, that we'll ever see in this world is people turning from worshiping a false god that is really not there to worshiping the true and living God. From worshiping a God that they claim they can see because they formed it with their own hands to worshiping a God that they can't see that claims to have made everything just speaking with his word. I suppose that's the most drastic thing you'll ever see. What I'd like to study tonight then is something about idolaters' conversions. The idolaters' conversion was several things. First, it was apparent. We still have the problem in our world today. We still have idolatry that runs rampant throughout the world. And to try to document this, I went directly to a Hindu website. So I'm not finding somebody who's angry at Hindus. I'm not finding somebody who's got, it, got an axe to grind against the Hindu religion. I'm reading from the Hindu American Foundation when I read to you these quotes about their defense of their worship of idols, symbols, and carved images. Here's how they defend it. But in Hinduism, idols, or murti, M-U-R-T-I, are worshipped as reminders of God. They say they're not really gods, they're reminders of gods. But listen to what they say and see if you find any contradictions. For example, every year in Mumbai, Hindus bring clay images of Lord Ganesha to their homes and worship him for a day or two before immersing the image in the sea. So they bring this carved image into their home, say it represents the Lord Ganesha. They worship him for a day or two, and then they go baptize him in the ocean. And then the ritual includes veneration, which they call aradhana, which involves welcoming the divine, bathing him, offering him food, clothes, perfumes, lamps, incense, and finally, words of praise. Here, the idol is seen as a vehicle, a physical, tangible carrier of God. They have the image. They bring it in, worship it, go bathe it in the sea. And then they bring it back into their homes, and sometimes they'll offer praise, and sometimes they'll offer food. I suppose the food is not eaten. They offer clothes to it, put perfumes on it, praise it with lamps and incense. But that's not the God, they say. It's just a reminder of the God. Well, number one, even if it is a reminder of the God, they still have some problems. But let's go on and finish their quote before we point them out. Thus, an important point is made, they say. Hindus don't worship idols, believing them to be gods. Rather, they view the statues and images as physical representations of God to help them focus on an aspect of prayer or meditation. This tradition is reflected in verse 12.5 of the Bhagavad Gita. That's one of their sacred books, which states that only a few have the time and mind to ponder and fix on the unmanifested absolute or abstract formless Brahman. Look up Brahman, you find it's the unifying principle of the universe to them. As such, it is easier, much easier, to focus on qualities, virtues, aspects of a manifested representation of God through one's senses emotions, and heart because of the way human beings naturally are. Furthermore, it is important to note that a murti in Hinduism is a form and manifestation of the omnipotent Brahman. Thus, a literal translation of murti as idol is incorrect, for Brahman is not actually confined to the idol, Additionally, Hindus believe that any object is worthy of worship as it contains divine energy. Now, wait a minute. They've just spent two paragraphs telling me how they're not worshiping idols. It's just a representation of an idol. And then in the same paragraph, in one sentence, they contradict everything that they've said. Hear that sentence again. Hindus believe that any object is worthy of worship as it contains divine energy. Now you see that in that old Disney flick Pocahontas where she worships the trees and the rocks and the wind because they all have souls within them. I forget the exact words, but that's what the song says. To them, this pulpit is worthy of worship because it was once a tree and these cars out here are worthy of worship because they have materials in them. That's what that sentence admits and you'll find it throughout the Hindu religion. 
He goes on to say, whether that be a slab of stone or a mosaic, the idols are designed with embedded symbolism, which set the style, proportion, colors, and legends associated with the deity. And sometimes they're very beautiful things, but they're not worthy of worship. For example, he says, Lord Shiva may be represented as a masculine idol with a third eye on his forehead as a half-man, half-woman figure called Ardhanazishvara or as a lingam statue. Regardless of his representation, worshipers will perform devotional practices around the statue as they do with all idols. They will sing community hymns. Bhajans, kirtans, and artis, words I barely know how to pronounce and don't know what they mean, expressing their devotion to the specific deity. These practices often occur in Hindu temples, which are usually structured around a single murti. These murtis are treated as revered guests. This is a guest in your home, a piece of stone or a piece of wood. And the daily routine includes awakening the murti in the morning and making sure that it is washed, dressed, and garlanded. You have to waken your God in the morning, wash it, put some clothes on it, and make it smell good. He says, in my home alone, my mother begins the day by lighting the dia and awakening the gods in our mini temple. The light illuminated is a sign, at least to me, that God is here in intangible form in this room with me. Well, it's no wonder that in India, when our brethren come across Hindus, they're persecuted. Many Hindus are persecuting many of our brethren very violently. If you read the missionary newsletters, they don't like it when someone is converted to the living God and nothing has changed. The Hindus worship these different idols and they believe all these different things and they bathe all these different things. And we like to think of that as being a very far away problem, but you know it's right out here on 250. And it has been since the 70s with the Hare Krishna community. They're just a branch of Hinduism. And I remember hearing reports of that's what they had to do in the morning was get up and bathe their gods and do that sort of thing. And so idolatry might be a little more close to home than we think. Thus it behooves us to study a little bit about what the Bible says about this sort of thing. And so I'd like to read from Jeremiah chapter 10 starting at verse 1. There's all kinds of places we could go in the Old Testament to read. But let's go here to Jeremiah chapter 10. Hear the word of Hear the word which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. These were God's people, but they had allowed idolatry into their midst, into their people, into their cities, and even into their temple that they had built for God. Thus says the Lord, Do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them. They worship the stars in many cases. For, as the, customs, for the customs of the peoples are futile. They're meaningless. For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. They are upright like a palm tree and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them for they cannot do evil. Nor can they do any good. Maybe you've seen in movies the depictions of people making a sacrifice to a god so the god won't do any evil to them. Well, look, the god had to be nailed in place so it wouldn't topple. That god can't do any evil. And it can't do any good either, Jeremiah says, by the word of the Lord to the people. He continues in verse 6. Inasmuch as there is none like you, O Lord, you are great and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your rightful due. For among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. But they are altogether dull-hearted and foolish. A wooden idol is a worthless doctrine. Silver is beaten into plates. It is brought from Tarshish and gold from Euphaz. The work of the craftsmen and the hands of the metalsmith, blue and purple are their clothing. They all work like, they are all the work of skillful men. I mean, these things look good, he says. They're the work of skillful men. But the Lord is the true God. 
He is the living God and the everlasting God. At his wrath, the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. Well, what evidence is there that he is the true and living God? Who is it? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God who predicted things through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that would come to pass. Like the rise and fall of cities, the rise and fall of nations. 300 and some prophecies concerning Jesus of Nazareth. The resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. That's the God about whom we speak. Who has intervened in history with 10 plagues for Israel when they got the law of Moses with miracles wonders and signs in the first century when we got the law of Christ that's the God about whom we speak who said you shall not have you shall have no other gods before me in Exodus 20 verse 3 so even if the Hindus are telling the truth and there is no God there but it's a representation of God they still say that every object deserves worship because it has divine energy. You shall have no other gods before me. But secondly, God said in the third commandment, I'm sorry, the second commandment in Exodus 20 verse 4, you shall make no graven image, no carved image of anything that is in heaven above or anything that is on earth or anything that is in the water under the earth. Don't make any carved image of anything. Don't worship God in any sort of carved image. Well, that's exactly what they're doing. And furthermore, it's what Israel did in Exodus chapter 32. Remember when Moses is up on the mountain and he's getting the law from people and the people are down below and they're scared about what to do. Aaron says to them, give me your gold and I'll fashion it into a golden calf. He makes a golden calf for them and then in Exodus 32 verse 4 he says to them, this is the God who brought you up out of Israel. He's defining the right God. But that's an image of God. That's a carved image. That's not a false God to which he's referring in his mind. But it is a false God in God's way of thinking because God said, don't make any carved image of me either or of anything for that matter. So idolatry can be a real problem. Now where do you go with that in our modern world in America where not a whole lot of people, I think 1.5 million Hindus in our country, something like that, but not a whole lot of people are bowing down to statues just yet. What do you do? Well, you know what the answer is. Anything in our lives that comes before God can become an idol. And we get that principle from Colossians chapter 3 verse 5 where Paul says that all these members of your body you have to put to death, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And those things also are echoed in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. One who is covetous is an idolater, that verse says. It's easy to put money before God, and that ought not to be. But there are other things that a person can put before God. I read an article that had 10 suggestions of the idols that Americans worship the most. And here are those suggestions from a lady by the name of Jennifer Slattery. I don't know her background, but here are her suggestions as to what we worship in this country besides God. Self. We think that ourselves are to be lifted up and we have our truths and we do our things. We lift up ourselves. Well, this kind of fallacy is dealt with in Daniel chapter 4 where Nebuchadnezzar looks at his kingdom and says, look at great Babylon that I have built for myself. And then immediately, as was prophesied, he becomes like a wild animal and has his senses taken away from him. She suggests also that we might worship security. We want to make sure that we're safe. And we'll give up any amount of freedom to make sure that we're safe. We might worship our security. Well, even though money is involved, that kind of what the rich young fool did in Luke 12, 16 through 21. He said, well, look at all this. I've got all my barns filled up. I'll know what I'll do. I'll tear them down, build bigger barns. Then I'll take time off and just relax. He thought he was secure. But the Lord required his soul of him that night and asked him, then whose will all this be? Where's all your security going to go? She suggests that we might worship approval. We want people to pat us on the back. We want people to like us. So we will not stand up against any sin. We will not stand up against any injustice. Well, this is addressed in the Bible as well. In John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43, there were those Pharisees who knew that Jesus was the Christ, but would not confess that Jesus was the Christ because they were afraid they'd be put out of the synagogue. 
Verse 43 explains, For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They wanted approval. Sometimes we can put our relationships above our relationship with God. And thus Jesus said, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he included all relationships if you put together Matthew 10, 37 and Luke 14, 26. We might have as an idol worldly success. That's dealt with in the Bible. You know, if I can climb the ladder of success and make it in this world and get the honors and climb the social ladder and go to the right things, then I've made it. But you know, the Apostle Paul had all that in the Jewish culture. He was on the top rung of the ladder. He said, I was an Israelite, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I excelled past my, uh, my contemporaries and my education, putting together Philippians 3 and Galatians chapter 1. And then he says, but I gave it all up so that I could follow Christ. And then we might worship our health. There's a generation now that, good for them, they're paying more attention to their health than maybe my generation or other generations have. But can it become a God? Yeah, if it's not kept in the proper perspective. A proper translation of 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8 says, For godliness profits a little, I'm sorry, for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of the life which is to come. Well, we used to say bodily, pro bodily exercise profits little, or at least that's the way I've heard it sometimes, meaning, eh, there's no point in exercise. But I think what it's saying, because that article is there in the Greek, if I remember correctly, bodily exercise does profit a little, but nothing like godliness profits. Godliness has the hope and the promise of better living in this life and then the hope of salvation in the next life. These are all different gods that we could have. Sometimes we might worship food, she suggests. Proverbs 23 and 28 have a little bit to say about gluttons. And then we might worship intellect. But Jeremiah said, God said through Jeremiah in Jeremiah 9, 23, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. I could be the smartest person in the world, but if I don't know God, I have nothing. We might worship comfort. And that was a problem in ancient Israel. Amos chapter 6 verse 4, woe was coming to these people. Bad things were coming to these people. Described like this, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, anoint yourselves with oil. Is in that passage, they just had a luxurious lifestyle and they worshipped it. And we might even worship people. What do we call people sometimes? Oh, that fellow's my idol. And sometimes we mean it in a very innocent way. But we might have to be careful that it doesn't become something else. The Apostle Paul looked up to certain people, sort of, in a, in a way, when he was going to Jerusalem. He was going to meet with elders. He was going to meet with other apostles. But when he writes about that experience in Galatians chapter 2, he says this. But from those who seemed to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. It's apparent that we might have a problem with idolatry in our world. Sometimes it enters into the Christian religion as people use a relic of somewhere of Christianity to try and offer their obeisance to God. And sometimes it enters into a narrative that, that most people believe. You know, I think most of the climate change narrative is about worshiping the earth, or it leads to that. I read an article by a preacher in Florida, David Sproul, a while back, that pointed out these facts that you can research and find the facts part of them to be true. 72% of the earth's surface is water. 72% of the earth's surface is water, and that's what controls the temperature. 28% of the earth's surface is land. Half of that is desert and mountainous regions that are uninhabitable. 
So only half of the 28% is even habitable and less than 10% of all the land that exists on earth is inhabited and that makes it less than 3% of the earth's surface that have man and men and women living on it. Less than 20% of the earth's population live in industrialized nations and that takes up less than 1% of the whole earth's surface and yet we have the arrogance, he points out, to think that we can do something to end the earth. We have the arrogance to think that we can set off and change the climate. We have the air can we change the rotation of the earth? Can we change the tilt of the axis of the earth? No. A lot of that gets back to worshiping the creature rather than the creator, Romans chapter 1 verse 25. And it's going to have some bad effects. Idolatry always has. We learned about growing up how in India some people worshipped cows and they were, there were famines going on but they, they couldn't eat the beef that they had there because they worshipped the cows. Well you know what one of the prime targets of the environmentalists is, don't you? Cows. Because they issue methane which is a carbon gas and supposedly is destroyed. So they would love to see the beef production go way down and people go hungry so that we can save the planet. We're not going to save the planet. God's going to destroy the planet when he wants. When Christ comes back, there is such a thing as a second coming of Christ, and he is coming, and those things will take place then. We have to be careful about the devil's lies causing us to incrementally slip into some sort of idolatry. When that happens, we have to remember the gospel, which affects people. The conversion of the idolaters was affecting. When those people in Thessalonica found out the Jews found out that the Gentiles were being converted and they found out that the apostles were converting in Jews. They accused the apostles of something that I suppose they took as a compliment even though it was meant to be an insult. They said these fellows are turning the world upside down. Acts chapter 17 verse 6. What they were doing was turning the world right side up to worship the right God in the way he was saying to be worshipped. And the conversion of the idolaters was altering so much that people could get back to the right God. In Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 11, God, after that long description we read earlier, God says to Jeremiah, Say to them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. When Christ comes back and sets the world on fire, all those gods... If they be steel, if they be gold, they will melt to nothingness. If they be wood, they will be burned. All those gods will go away. But the living God will send his son, Jesus Christ, to judge, to destroy those who would not follow him after his great gift and sacrifice. But he'll come to save those who have turned to him. C.S. Lewis once said, Human history is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. We'll try anything. We'll try this God. We'll try that God. We'll try this performer. We'll try that performer. We'll try this amusement. We'll try that amusement. We'll try wealth. We'll try whatever we can. Anything but God. But everybody will bow to Jesus Christ when he comes back. And every tongue will confess him as Lord. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. And so what we ought to do is find what can give us true joy now during the rest of our time on earth. And that is to give our lives to the God of heaven by whose word the heavens and the earth and everything under the earth were made just as he spoke. Give your lives to him. Confess his son, Jesus, as the son of God. Repent of sins. Be baptized for the remission of sins and live faithfully to him. If we could help you, would you please come as we stand and sing?